I use something called a major method. We turn the numbers into letters and the letters will create a word. Five times every second, it's looking for threats. It's scanning the environment to say, am I safe? And with that sort of brain, how can you expect it to consistently just be happy all the time, especially if you haven't worked on it? After 20 minutes, we lose around 40% of the information we've just learned. Within a day, up to 70%. Within six or seven days, it's around 86, 90% of the information is gone. Hi everyone and welcome to this episode of the podcast. This episode is all about memories. I have a terrible memory. Look, I've just owned it as well. I've just said that out loud, okay? My memory's not as good as it could be. And the reason it's not, I need to find out. And that's why today's guest is Josh McCartney, who's an expert memory coach. And he's gonna go through some tricks, some tools, and some strategies that we can use to help our memory perform better. Remember, they say working out builds muscles in the gym. Using your mind the right way and training your brain builds muscles for your memory. So let's get stuck into this one, cue the music and enjoy the episode. With the impact of climate change and the growing population on the planet, by 2050, we're not going to have enough food to feed everybody. We have to think about different ways of doing it. How we address that problem is a difficult and complicated one, but one that our sponsor, Smartcast, is dealing with head on. They want to solve food security for the world. So go check out Smartcast. They're doing something really valuable with their farming technologies. Go check out Smartcast Tech on Instagram. That's S M A R T K A S. T-E-C-H, tech, okay? Check them out on Instagram, follow them, look at what they're doing because they are solving a big problem, the world food security problem. And they need your support just as they do mine. So please make the effort to go and check them out. Najahi Events are one of our sponsors and have been now since the beginning. They bring motivational speakers, inspirational leaders here into the region so that we can benefit from their knowledge and wisdom. Go and check them out because they offer really valuable education resources for you to improve your life, whether that's investing, whether that's personal development, whether that's learning how to build social media platforms, all of this kind of stuff, they offer the knowledge around it. So Najahi Events are on Instagram, N-A-J-A-H-I Events. Go check them out. Josh, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Spencer. Looking forward to it. So you're a memory coach. Correct. Help. <laughs> <laughs> I think when I think about I think about memory, it's so easy for each of us to, 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 to kind of like associate a loss of memory or forgetfulness in some way. For me, you know, years ago I used to say to people, I've got a terrible short-term memory, but I've got a really good long-term memory. Uh, I used to say, I've got a memory for faces, but I don't have a memory for names. You know, I'll meet somebody, I forget their name very quickly. But you know what? If I've seen someone before, I'm never going to forget their face. I'm 52 next week, and when I'm 52, um, I'm going to have to say I'm forgetful of most things. So my first question to you is, does your memory get bad while we get older? There's a few questions in that um, and a lot of avenues to go down, but no, your memory shouldn't get worse as you age. The problem is it's just like going to the gym, right? So when you go to the gym and you work out your muscles, they get bigger, mm -hmm. right? Can't really argue with that. The brain is just the same. With neuroplasticity, it can continue to grow until the day we die, essentially. So if you start to learn to train things like names and faces, then you can actually get significantly better at it, right? But you know, when you're a kid, you don't really have many distractions, right? All you're doing is you're focused on one thing, you've got your imagination, your creativity, your fun, your playfulness, your emotions, everything at play. So when you focus on one thing, you have all those together, you remember the information very, very well. But as we age, we get more responsibilities, we have more things to you know, focus on in different areas of our life. So you'll focus on this thing, but you're thinking about that. So you can never really remember what that is <laughs> as you get older, right? So as you get older, we, we meet so many people. You know, in, before phones and everything, we'd meet about 150 to 300 people in our lifetime, actually shake hands and have a proper conversation. Now you do that in, in about a month or something, right? So you can't expect the brain to keep up with the, the acceleration of technology that, uh, and the, the need to meet so many people anymore, right? So the brain says, that's not important information, delete. So your memory doesn't need to get worse, it just means you might need to learn new techniques or you might need to be more deliberate with your memory. Am I then deleting unimportant stuff? Yes, that Amazing. is what your brain does. All the so time. all that stuff I forget is just not important? To you, yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I, I want, can you give me that in a written document so I can give it to my <laughs> wife? <laughs> I can. 
I have a great memory, so it's not important. <laughs> yeah, these, these things aren't important, and, and my memory doctor has told me categorically that that's what happens. Mm. Okay, that's interesting. But, you know, we'll forget things, and we'll, you know, we'll rack our brains trying to remember somebody, yeah. you know, remember a name, or remember a, a recipe, or remember mm. something that was, you know, on TV last night. What was that, or what was the name of the actor that was in it? Right. And it, you know, it's on the tip of my tongue. Yeah. Okay. It will come back to me in a minute. You know yeah. about that kind of stuff. Oh, absolutely. How do we, how do we then find that? How do I go from the it's on the tip of my tongue and I walk around the house three times thinking what was I thinking? <laughs> okay, and get that away, get that out of the tip of my tongue, back yeah. into my memory. There's no foolproof. One hundred percent works every single time, but there is. You would look for related information to that. Okay, so if you're looking for a name, you might think about where you met the person, maybe what sort of conversation you had, maybe you spoke about something in common, maybe there's something that, uh, an association that just clicks eventually, but you're looking for related information, not necessarily that one specific piece, because if you can't find it, you're almost blocking your brain from finding that piece of information. You'll keep going, what's the name? It starts with an A, it starts with an A, 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 and then you get lost with somebody else's name. So you're actually getting something which uh, scientists refer to as retroactive interference. So old memories are trying to compete with new memories. Right, so if I ask you what you had for lunch yesterday, it's pretty easy because it's pretty recent. But if I ask you 17 days ago, then there's 17 different lunches trying to figure out which one was which. So the memories themselves are trying to, to find their way to the top and they're getting confused, essentially. So um, yeah, so you would look for related information around that topic, where you okay, were, Okay, well you did, oh, I've got to stop here. You scared me now because I can't remember what I had for lunch yesterday. That's right. That, all that did is made me think about, what did I have for lunch <laughs> yesterday? So then you think about where you were. Where were you yesterday? At lunchtime. Just yesterday. I was here, I had, me no, I had meetings out yesterday morning. I, I was at, at lunchtime, I was at, oh, that's right, I was at uh, Bayute's offices yesterday mm -hmm. lunchtime, 11 till one. Okay, and where were you for lunch? I didn't have any lunch, but they had some, there we go. they had some croissants and some, muffins and some finger food and stuff right. there. So there you go, you figured it out. <laughs> Your memory's fine, it just wasn't instant recall because you didn't think you needed it. It wasn't important until I brought it up. Right? Okay. So you've, you got there eventually, you look for related information like where you were, what was happening, so you're looking for a location, you're looking for a story around what's going on, you're looking for um, people who was there, what was happening, so you're looking for all that related information to find that piece of information. Regardless, your, your brain isn't just going to go, oh, 17 days ago, 3 p.m. had that, you know? <laughs> it's not how the brain works. It has to delete so much information. We have so much stimulus happening. Like, think about your left earlobe right now. It's been there the whole time, but until you focus on it, your brain doesn't actually recognize it's there. Just like your nose, it's there right now, but kind of, you see through it, essentially. It just deletes it while you're not paying attention to it. And the same goes for information uh, in conversations or what you've done recently. Your brain just deletes stuff to keep it running efficiently. It actually means that your brain is really, really working well. <laughs> so it needs to delete as much as it needs to remember. At the beginning of the conversation, you said it's much like going to the gym because your brain is a muscle. Mm -hmm. I go to the gym every day, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, I go there religiously. I wake up at 4.30 every day. I go to the gym at 5 till 6 every day. That's part of my routine that Great. I need. I don't think about it. I'm on autopilot when I do that. Mm. My wife thinks I'm mad for getting up that time of day. A lot of my audience think I'm mad for getting up that time of day, but I right. do it. I, I need it. And you say you're working on your physical strength and your muscle. Mm -hmm. It helps set me up for a positive day. Absolutely. How do I train my brain? Yep. Because I wouldn't know where to start with that. Most people don't, to be honest. Apps that you know, you'll play a Scrabble or a crossword puzzle or one of their little apps in their ecosystem. The problem is the studies that show that the apps don't make your memory any better. They just make you better at playing those games. So you feel like your memory is getting better, but actually it doesn't cross translate into actual life. So if you're trying to learn and remember specific things in your life, say it's conversations, say it's a course, say it's numbers, say it's presentations, whatever you're trying to learn and remember, you would actively try to remember that and try to get better at it, right? So if it's going to be conversations, then you would start to remember key points and you know, spit that back to that person at the end of a sentence or you know, a bit of a discussion, say, oh, so here are all the key points. Is that right? And then ask questions about it because your curiosity engages the brain and makes it more curious. So acti actively attempting to remember information rather than just saying, I have a bad memory. <laughs> so passive, that's more of a passive sort of training system where it's like using what your brain already does in the daytime and just being more deliberate about it. Like how often do you think about what you did in the daytime from the beginning to the end? Uh, rarely. You don't really, right? Um, most people don't. Well, I don't know anybody that does at least. 
Um, how often do you try to remember people that you met you know, six months ago? I never do. You never do, right? How often do you try to remember what you had for lunch yesterday? I never do. So are you really using your memory? Just a question. I don't want to give the wrong answer here, but I think, I think the answer is no. Deliberately, right? Yeah. Because now day and age, everything's happening so fast. We need to be now. We need to be future focused, not past, right? And we're outsourcing everything to you know, assistants or to the phone is a big one. Uh, we outsource our brain to hold information we don't think is relevant. So essentially your brain says, it's there, I don't need it. But the problem is it doesn't know when to stop saying I don't need it. Because we keep putting everything on the phone, everything, everything. Do that, everything, on the phone. <laughs> so your brain is saying, I don't need anything. Why would I? You know, it's, it's there. So it yeah, can but hold on a minute, something's happened, you know. So I'll have a situation where there's someone I know I needed to call mm -hmm. and I'll forget to call them. Mm -hmm. There's someone I know I needed to reach out to and I'll forget to reach out to mm -hmm. them. And, and then, like, like, four weeks later, I'll be like, oh, oh. And it's, it's yeah. not an unimportant. It's not like phoning, you know, a long-lost family friend or family member, sorry, just for a catch-up. It's catch like up, an important yeah. phone call. Yeah. That if I haven't put it in my diary and scheduled it in my yeah. diary, um, I, I can go weeks and, and forget all about it. And then it, what it will do is it will pop into my mind. So I'll be, the, one happened this morning. I was driving back from the gym, okay, and I was listening to some of your content. Somebody popped into my mind, somebody I needed to call. Right. By the time I got home, I'd forgotten again who that was. <laughs> right. I couldn't remember. I was like, oh, why didn't I call that person? And then I'd completely mm. forgotten. Yeah. What's going on there? So you're not forming a strong enough need inside your brain at least. Like you know that the information is, is important, but you're not telling your brain that it's important, okay? There's, there's, it's two different things. Knowing something is you need to get it done versus your brain thinking it's relevant for essentially survival, um, then it will say, don't need it, goodbye again. So in that sort of moment, it's about developing the skill to create more associations around it, okay? So instead of saying, I need to call that person later, we need to create more associations, okay? So maybe you think about Later in the day, you're gonna have a cup of coffee, and when you're having a drink or whatever it's gonna be, you imagine yourself on the phone to that person. Or you know, you open the door and imagine that person, you know, you're shaking their hand or something, right? We're trying to create more associations, we're trying to create more triggers for the brain to think, ah, oh, recall, gotta do that. Rather than thinking, it's important, I'll remember it later. Because by saying, I'll remember it later, you're saying, I don't need it. So like when you meet somebody for the first time, and you ask them what their name is, mm -hmm. and they say their name is, I don't know, Anna. And you say to them, just spell that for me, mm -hmm. so I make sure I get it right. And they mm -hmm. say A-N-N-A. -N -N -A. Yep. Am I trying to associate those letters in a way that I can help remember that name? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah? You are, so you're creating an extra piece of information connected to her name as well. And you've also taken the time to be focused on the name. That's a big thing. People will say, what's your name? in one ear out the other, right? So you're not focusing on it. That's generally the biggest struggle. Anything that improves your, me your focus also improves your memory. So if you're saying Anna, A-N-N-A, -A, you're focused on the name for another three to five seconds at least. So you're actually taking it in. You're getting time to absorb it. Then, if you really want to remember stuff long term, so say you remember Anna today, and then six weeks later you've forgotten Anna. It's perfectly normal. If you don't use it, you lose it, okay? so. Just like our muscle fibers, the, the connections in our brain that reinforce our memories, they also experience atrophy. So after 20 minutes, we lose around 40% of the information we've just learned. Within a day, up to 70%, within six or seven days, it's around 86, 90% of the information is gone. Me, you, all of us, that's how it works. And if you want to offset that, we need to do something called space repetition, which is you recall it, but increasing intervals of time. So say you learn Anna's name now, then, an hour later, or 20 minutes later, you think, what was her name? Anna, okay, cool. And then, when you go to bed at night, create the habit of when you brush your teeth, who did I meet today? Anna, okay, she works here, she does this, la la la. So you're creating the habit of remembering it. And who did I meet recently? So you're starting to strengthen those connections over time, right? So you remember it an hour, a day, a few days after that, a week after that, a couple of weeks. So you're increasing the intervals of recall, mm -hmm. and that is strengthening the connection. And that is for long-term retentive information. But if you just remember it now, Anna, six weeks later, who's Anna? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's my wife, so I'll be in trouble if I do it. <laughs> so, but, okay. I've seen you before somewhere. <laughs> I know your face, but I don't know your name. That's interesting you say that. Let's, let's, let's think about people then that have got anxiety or people that maybe have got depression. Mm -hmm. Is it harder for somebody in that type of mental state 
to remember. And the reason I ask that is that when somebody's depressed, they have a clear line of thought mm -hmm. about how, how they feel, whether it's right or wrong, okay, it's in their head how yeah. they feel. Does it, and that to me seems almost like a focus. It is. A focus on that 100%. feeling. So does it make it easy then to focus on other things and remember or, or not, would you say? If you're not depressed. If you are depressed. If you are depressed, you're remembering your problems really well. Right. So your memory's fine. <laughs> and when you're anxious, the problem is it's the same almost identical physiological state in the body as, as excitement, right? So anxiety and excitement are almost exactly the same physiology and biology, right? But what the difference is, is the narrative in the mind. So what you're thinking on and focusing on the story of anxiety equals, what if this happens? This could be the worst thing ever. And your brain starts to freak out, starts to go faster and faster. But if you're excited, it's like, this awesome thing's about to come up. I'm so excited for it to happen. You know, it's like Christmas as a child, you're excited. It's the same feeling, but a different narrative. Okay, so to, to control the anxiety, you would just think, I'm excited. I'm excited, I'm excited, I'm excited, I'm excited. And then your brain will ask, what am I excited about? And then you can change the narrative, right? So then you can start to you know, increase your focus and to be able to um, remember better for things you actually find important. But if you're depressed, you're generally remembering and, and rehearsing the story. That's generally what depression is. You remember a story that is keeping you pulled down. And it's been shown that within a year, 50% of the details minimum of memory is completely changed. So every single time you remember a memory, it changes. It's like having a, a, a Word document open on edit mode. Every time you pull it up, you change the details. Every time you remember the memory. So after a while, you, you just keep recalling the, the story about why you're depressed. So you're rehearsing and you remember that really, really well. You're like, why are you upset? <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> I've been through this so many times, I can tell you word for word exactly why I'm depressed right now. And they're holding themselves down because of the story that they're telling, not necessarily because of the actual memory. The memory can't hurt you, it's gone, it's in the past. But the emotion is the thing that keeps people stuck and the story that they keep telling themselves about it. So if you wanna change the emotion, you wanna change the depression, you've gotta start changing the story. And the story can change by your perspective of the story. So people, because I, I do a lot of NLP with people as well, right? So they'll have you know, childhood trauma and all these things. And it'll be the worst thing that's ever happened to them but it's also created their biggest strengths in their entire life. It's created who they are, it's created why they are strong now. So it's actually the best thing that's ever happened to them. So how can you reframe the story of the worst thing that's ever happened to how is this the best thing that's happened for me? Because I, you know, I grew up as fat, bullied, overweight, did homeschooling, all this stuff, and I have a sad past as well. Best friend died, you know, I was young sort of thing. And that has created some of the best things for me. The reason I speak now and have a voice to, to present in front of people is because I wasn't allowed one as a kid, right? So I could hold on to that story as uh, I wasn't allowed to laugh because my uncle didn't like it. I wasn't allowed to you know, have fun. I wasn't allowed to do these things. I could hold on to that and I could repeat that story and rehearse it or I could change the framing of it. So interesting. You, you think about you remember that story and you focus on that story it stays there and you go on that repeat 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 mm -hmm. and it's change the story change the outcome you've got to change the story and you've got to then essentially remember to do that over and over and over again yeah, so that pattern that, that pattern becomes a habit okay yeah so we all have around 60 to 70 thousand thoughts a day right how many between 60 and 70 thousand a day that right. hurts my head just hearing that. It does, right? Sixty to seventy thousand thoughts a day. Every single day. But you know, even if kicker? some hold on, even if some of them are the same, so or the, sixty to seventy thousand is separate one. Ninety-five percent are the same as the day before. So by the time we turn about thirty-five years old, we've essentially memorized our personality. We have rehearsed the patterns, the behaviors, the beliefs, the perceptions to keep us as who we think we are. So we, and that's triggered by our environment, by the people that we know, by the things, the places we go to. So we wake up in the morning, the first thing you do is generally gonna be the same thing. For most people, it's pick up the phone. And then you can remember your problems <laughs> straight away. And then your body goes through the motion. It goes, you know, you think about the bathroom and then you're in the bathroom, you know, doing your business. And then the picture comes, coffee. And then you're in the, in the kitchen having a coffee. And then whatever your next steps are, it's generally, you can pick up yesterday and place it on today. Because the brain is essentially trying to save energy. It's trying to go through the motions without you know, using finite resources, essentially. So it will create these habits and it'll create these patterns to keep you stuck in the, it's not trying to keep you happy, it's trying to keep you alive. 
That's it. It doesn't care if you're happy or not. <laughs> and that's the, the thing that people get confused with is like, why am I happy? It's like the brain wasn't designed to be happy. It was designed to keep you alive. So the amygdala, the, the emotional response system, uh, control system in the brain, it's asking five times a second if you're safe. Five times every second. It's looking for threats. It's scanning the environment to say, am I safe? And with that sort of brain, how can you expect it to consistently just be happy all the time, especially if you haven't worked on it? You know, you can help happiness, you can help everything. It's like a muscle. You build it over time with consistent repetition, essentially. Otherwise, 95% of your thoughts are the same as yesterday. You can kind of expect what outcome you're going to have in the year's time, who you're going to be, how you're going to feel, mm. if you keep doing the same motions. A typical client of yours would be who? Don't give me a big range. Narrow it down. Give me an example of a typical client of yours. Sure. In terms of memory, it'll be presentations, speeches, and uh, you know, learning new information, specifically for like courses or um, if they're moving industry into a new sector. So say one of my clients was in IT, he moved into HR. So he needs to learn all the terminology, the vocabulary for the new industry. So learning how to remember information for vocabulary and topics and that sort of thing is important, right? <laughs> so they need to understand how to remember information in that perspective. Um, some people will need to remember numbers, so they want to remember the entire P&L statement, so say 230, 50 numbers in different rows and columns and percentages and totals, be able to remember that, uh, to memorize that each month or every three months or whatever the, the amount of time allocates for. Um, when it comes to mental health, it'll be people with overthinking, anxiety, depression, that, that consistent feeling of just heaviness where your heart's sinking in your chest and you're okay. falling over. Um, Hold on a minute. Let's take an example there then. Okay. So you said um, speeches. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you have a corporate client that comes to you. They've got to go and stand on a stage. They've got to give a speech. Yep. And they've got the, they've got the printed out A4 documents, but they've got to memorize that speech Correct. because there's no auto cue. Yep. Okay. Tell me what you would do with somebody to help them learn that speech. Sure. So I've done it with a couple of different TEDx speakers as well. Um, so they had that exact thing. You know, two and a half, three thousand words sitting in front of them. How the hell am I going to remember that? <laughs> yeah. And it's 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 overwhelming actually for most people because if you don't know the techniques, you're going to do what most people do: is you read it, you speak it out loud, try to remember it, and then you speak it out loud again, try to remember it. You get a bit further down, you've forgotten the first part. So now you're starting back here, and then you're trying to jump in between, right? And without a system, it can be really daunting. Mm. Yeah. So there are different techniques that I like to use for speeches, specifically for memorization. Mm -hmm. One that I've coined called mass verbatim. It sounds like something else, but it's not. Mass verbatim, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So essentially what it is, is you are taking all the words, say in a sentence or a paragraph, you're writing down the first letter of the word. So you write down the first letter. And then of what, each word in that sentence. Of each word in the sentence. And you right. keep in grammar, you keep in punctuation, capitals, full stops, commas, all this stuff. So then when you look at the, the letters, you can actually see the words. And you actually start to speak the words as you're reading the letters. Then you would look away and try to remember it. And nine times out of 10, they'll be able to remember it, just like that. And it takes like 30 seconds to remember a sentence or a, a paragraph. Um, and that's a really, really good example of training a focus. Because you're not doing any memory techniques there. You're mm -hmm. just actually focused on the, the material. Then the second one that I'll generally use in conjunction with, the, with that as well will be a memory palace. Have you used a memory palace or heard about it before? A memory palace. A memory palace? Yeah. Never heard of that. Never heard of it. Cool. So it's a very old technique, actually. It was a guy called Semenides back in you know, ancient Greece or something, thousands of years ago. He had a dinner party once. And I don't know, he stepped out to have a phone call or something like that a couple of thousand years ago. In ancient Greece, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, <laughs> stepped out for a moment. And the roof collapsed in the building, crushing all of his dinner guests around the table. So they're all dead. And the loved ones couldn't identify the bodies because they were too mangled. So what he did, he remembered who was where based on the location they were sitting. So that kind of gave birth to the memory palace is you can save information to locations, right? If you think about what you were wearing two days ago, what goes through your mind? No idea. You're probably trying to think about where you were. Two days ago, crikey. So um, you're thinking about a story probably, like what was happening that day, who did I have to meet? thinking about stories, and then you would go to locations in your mind about where was I during the daytime to try and pinpoint what you were wearing. I think I was at home all day, that's Monday. Right. I think I was at home all day and I was wearing black polo shirt, black shorts, black trainers. Great. So you've used location to remember the information, right? So memory actually links to the location which you learn it. I can still remember where I learned Pythagoras theorem. <laughs> I can remember the desk they were sitting on in the, the classroom, the math place, right? I can remember that. 
because information links to the locations. Okay? So when it comes to a memory palace, we are deliberately using spaces that we're familiar with. So say your home right now. We can go through a quick example. And we will save information deliberately. And then when you want to remember it, you think about the space, and then that will spark the information. So remember it, and then you go to the next space. And then you can remember that. So you're essentially remembering your entire speech just by walking around your house in your mind. Walking around the house and remembering parts of the house. Correct. I have to make a lot of content. And the, the team, there's a, there's a social media team behind us and they, they'll give us a script. And I, I won't be able to remember it. So it's mm. like take after take after take after take. Right. And then I'll go, I don't want to use the script. I will do it based upon what I understand, what I've learned, okay? And then what they always say to me is, that was much better. Right. Okay, because it's natural as opposed to a scripted situation. Yeah. Does that make yeah, sense? Absolutely. When I've tried to learn a script, I find it really frustrating. Mm. And I use excuses. So I'm going to put my hands up here and I'll make excuses to people like Claire and Alex. They're not the kind of words I would normally <laughs> use. It's right. not being written in words that I, I wouldn't say. I wouldn't say a sentence that way right. to try and justify why I can't do it. Mm. rather than just learning it. And if there was a technique where I could learn something like that, which is essentially one, two, three, eight sentences, right. very quickly, very easily, make everybody in my team's life a whole lot easier. Totally. Well, let's have a quick trial then. Um, I would normally have a couple sessions to see if I can get this, get to you to this point. But let's say that there's eight sentences. Yeah. Let's just say that you have five. Let's just create five places right now, okay, in, in the house. So imagine number one can be the, the, the painting behind you. Yeah. Okay, so number one is the painting. Number two can be the, the windows over there, mm -hmm. so number two. Number three can be the floor. Oh, no, let's use the, the, the photos here. Mm -hmm. Number three is there. Number four can be the table. Uh-huh. And number five can be this entire unit over there. Okay. Okay, so what was number one? The picture. Number two. The window. Number three. The painting, uh, the uh, photos. Number four. Table. Five. That, that Three. cabinet. Three was p uh, pictures. Five. Um, cabinet. Two. Um, window. Four. Uh, table. Very good. So, you remember five places. Now what we want to do is we want to save the information in those places. So Josh, what was it say? Struggled throughout. Josh struggled through much of his school years and was told time and time again he would never amount to anything. Okay, cool. So can you imagine me and the painting maybe struggling in a, a life uh, in a straight jacket or something like that? Struggling, okay. struggling to get out, right? But I'm in school, so you can imagine it's a the painting is a, it's a big school. Okay, mm -hmm. so Josh struggles. So it's a painting of a school with you struggling in a straight jacket. Exactly. Okay. So Josh struggled throughout many of his schooling years, time and time again. Right. That's kind of the main point at that point. Um, then the second one, what is it? Um, but rather than wallow in self pity, he decided to harness his own potential. Okay. So instead of wallowing self pity, I imagine myself kind of like you know, bent over in the the window in self-pity, um, decide to harness his uh, full potential. So I imagine some sort of harness, like I'm putting on a harness to go skydiving or something, mm -hmm. right? So Josh struggled throughout these nice schooling years, la la la, la. Uh, instead of following in self-pity, he decided to harness his full potential. So I imagine myself over there. I'm okay. thinking about the sun coming through the window and harnessing the sun. Great, use that. Okay, great. Okay. So if that works for you, that's what you should use because yeah. you have your associations, I have mine, we're two yeah, different yeah. brains, use yours. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so what's the, the third one? Third one is, uh, sounds a bit superhuman, actually started to learn and teach himself memory techniques. Cool, so how could you do that? How could you make me superhuman and start teaching myself memory techniques at the photos section? There's a picture of Superman, I've got to go down there, that's a super mm -hmm. thing. And I think, I, for some reason, comic book as soon as I've associated there, and I'm thinking cool. about um, uh, a comic book character pointing at his temples as if he's got right. you know, a laser memory or a superpower that's a memory. Perfect. That's great. Okay. So people think it's superhuman, but actually started to teach himself his memory techniques. Right, so that's in the, that section. So now we've got you know, a pretty decent amount of it already memorized. Yeah. These are almost more like checkpoints or bullet points of it. You're not trying to do word for word perfectly, but you've kind of got the gist properly. What would be the fourth? The more he taught himself, he couldn't understand why people didn't know how to improve their memories. Right. So you can almost enlarge this table in your mind. So I'm teaching myself here, and I'm sitting around with like all these notes or something like that. 
and then you see all the other people at the ends of the table. It's like, why don't people know about this? Yeah. Uh -huh. The more he teaches himself these memory techniques, he starts to understand what uh, to qu ask the question. Why don't these people know <laughs> about these techniques, right? So yeah. can you kind of visualize that as well? Yeah, I can visualize you, you looking at them, thinking they're a bit stupid. Yeah, something like that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then last one. Teach people and started to share his learnings. Cool. So how could you make that happen? Turn that cabinet into a frame, mm -hmm. and that frame, rather than being a full cabinet, is just a frame, and you're stood on top of it with a, a blackboard behind it. Cool. And so what is that? What is it? Uh, the blackboard's to? teaching other people. Yeah, perfect. Okay, cool. so you're on a frame, you're standing on a frame and you're teaching other people. So it's like, I mean, I'm 50, so we have blackboards, not whiteboards, as right. you guys had. Okay, the blackboard and you've got chalk in your hand and you're, you're essentially writing on the board teaching. Great, great. Okay. So then you've got, you know, Josh struggled throughout high school. Uh, for so, many, yeah, okay, well, let me yeah, try and remember that. This is interesting. Okay. So painting, the number one is a picture of a school and a straight jacket and you struggling in a straight jacket. Mm -hmm. Picture number two is, picture number two is you harnessing, oh gosh, picture number two is the window. So I remember you harnessing something. What Just think it? about context. What would the context of harnessing, you know, I'm wallowing in self-pity. I didn't remember the water and self pity thing. That's okay. okay. That's why I was slumped over in my yeah. Okay, picture. so slumped over, and then and then after you're slumped over, then you harness, then you harness from the sun. The okay. full potential. F harness from the sun, the potential. Okay. So maybe you can you know put a tent on the sun or something like that in your mind. Uh, okay, so that you can remember it better. So you, remember so you the go potential. deeper, harnessing the sun and then f f uh, harnessing the potential, and then tent as potential. Okay, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. So now I see you wallowing in self pity, then you open up and you're harnessing the sun, and then there's a tent there. Yeah. Okay. So instead of wallowing in self pity, decide to harness his full potential. Yeah. Okay. Right. And the so, next one? And the next one is the pictures over there and the photos, and you create the superpower essentially. Yeah. So you, you became superhuman, okay, and uh, you started to create the superpower about how you can get a better memory. Mm -hmm. What was it? So actually? I started to learn. Okay, techniques. so I started to, oh, yeah, learning myself more mm -hmm. memory techniques, okay? Yeah. So you're doing good. So the reason. Am I doing good or am I doing no, bad? You're doing, you're doing perfect. So the, I'm just correcting you a little bit in some parts because it just means you need to make the, the image stronger. Okay. okay, so if you forget something, put extra onto it. Just ask yourself, why did I forget that? I didn't make this word strong enough or something, or how can mm -hmm. I make this word stronger? Mm -hmm. So, you know, its ability seems to be superhuman, but it's actually something he taught himself, these techniques. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, the next one is... Okay, it's here, the more, uh, the more the, the, on the table, so the, you're at the end of the table, understanding it, and there's people at the other end of the table, and you're like, why yeah. don't you get it? You yeah, know, duh. exactly. Yeah, exactly. you're looking at them like they're a bit daft, why don't you get it? Yeah, why doesn't anybody know about this stuff? Yeah. yeah. And then after that, over there, you wanted to create a framework um, because you wanted to teach other people how to do it themselves. Exactly. Perfect. So that's awesome. Well done. So yeah. normally I would actually take people through creating these images to, to make them stronger and faster before teaching them how to actually do these compounds. These are compound visual cues, essentially. So we're adding pictures to pictures and stories into pictures. So if you were going to teach me a speech and I was to spend two or three hours with you, by using that technique and I'm sure others, we could slowly get to a point where essentially what I'm doing is I'm creating uh, these associations, but they're, they're almost bullet point images yeah. that then can allow me to talk about the subject Absolutely. from the bullet point image. And so a lot of the time I say to people, don't give me a script, give me bullet points, mm. but you're giving me bullet point images. Exactly. Okay, which are obviously I can visualize way more. Yeah. Exactly. People say they learn in different ways. Some people say they learn when they listen and, and, and you know that kind of stuff. Um, if I go for a walk, or I was to sweep the drive, or wash a car, or do something mundane, I learn what I'm listening. Mm -hmm. If I was to sit here and listen, none of it goes in. Like mm -hmm. none of it. None of it, of course. Like none of it at all. Yeah. This is why school is a little bit wrecked in this way. So. Okay. Yeah. Hold on a minute. Okay. <clears throat> If you were to draw me a picture, so like literally with a flip chart or whiteboard or whatever, you were to draw me a picture and explain how something worked by drawing pictures, I get it first time and pretty much 90% of it will stay with me forever. Mm -hmm. Is that just because I learn that way or is that some form of, 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 of pattern that everybody follows? So the thing about this is it's one of the weirdest fallacies that I've heard is like the, the memory learning styles. Yeah, it, it, to an extent, absolutely, it works. But if I were to give people a list of 10, 15 words, for example, just to memorize, if you look at them, you'll remember about four to seven. If you hear them, you'll probably remember about four to seven. If you smell them, you probably won't remember as many of them, maybe four to seven. You'll remember around the same amount, but you'll remember them better with pictures. 
But then you remember them significantly better if you use pictures, if you use your other senses, and if you use stories or locations as well. So you'd be able to remember all 15 of them if you knew how to use them. So we all learn through our senses. It's what plugs us into the environment, right? So memory just refers to taking in, sense, uh, taking in information from our sensory inputs. We process it, we store it, and then we later retrieve it. That's memory in a nutshell. We all learn visually. We all learn auditorily. We all learn kinesthetically. Or, um, olfactory and gustatory. We have all those senses. We have like 21. But we have those senses. So we learn through them. But what happens is when you're a kid and you hear something, you're like, I remember that. I'm an auditory learner. And then somebody else goes, I remember that picture. I'm a visual learner. Someone else does something with their hands, like woodwork. It's like, I'm an uh, experiential learner or something like that, right? We all are, all of them combined. <laughs> but when it comes to taking in lots of information, visual is the highest form of it. Because if I get you to close your eyes, and open your eyes for a second or two, you'll take in so much information, right? Very, very quickly. But if I'll try to explain it to you by using my voice and you hearing it, it will take a long time. It takes a lot longer. So there's a couch, it's this color, there's, there's plants there, like it, it would take a long time and you still can't really form that image properly. So visual is a really, really high form of processing information because we can take in so much so quickly. So visual, this is why we use pictures in the memory palace is because we learn better with pictures, right? It's interesting, you know, as I think about it, you know, the first one was this picture here and it was um, a school and it was you in a straight jacket. And I wonder if me drawing the school and a picture of you in a yeah. straight jacket then makes, obviously makes that even. It will make it absolutely yeah. significantly better, yeah. And so it, does that mean then that if I explain something on a video and I use storytelling and animation, mm -hmm. I've got a much better chance of getting the viewer to connect with it and keep it in their head? Absolutely. And then the kicker is emotion. Okay. So if you want to make people remember, use emotion. So, so I obviously make a lot of content. I don't make any animated content. Right. But if I made animated content telling the story, and that animated content could be literally a camera, could be. Here, looking down at me with me drawing pictures, that it could be as simple as that type of animation. Yeah, it could be like a, a B-roll, like on the top of like an overlay of the video, yeah, yeah. and you're drawing. Because using diagrams and using pictures helps. You know, if you have somebody explain something, it's not until they show you a visual representation that you're like, get it, got it, mm. unless you already are familiar with that information. So if it's a brand new concept to somebody, show them visually, they'll get it better. <laughs> Interesting. Um, but, you know, you need to be speaking to the person and what they're actually interested in, and then you need to create an emotional connection. You know, when it comes to like marketing, you use aggravation to try and like get people's pain points or whatever it is, right? Because it's emotional. People remember emotion very, very well. Like you remember your scariest nightmares, right? You remember the first time you kissed another person? <laughs> I don't. No? No, I don't remember the first time I kissed somebody, but I definitely remember my first nightmare. Okay. Oh, I, I, I remember still to this very day, the first horror movie I watched. Right. When I was right. at youth club, okay, <laughs> bear in mind, I was 50, yeah, I was at youth club, they had a, it was American Werewolf in London, and I can picture very clearly to this day mm. most of it, and if I close my eyes at night and I picture it, I have to open my eyes to get right. rid of it. Yeah, because it's highly emotionally charged. Yeah. So you remember it because there's so much emotion involved. But whether it's positive or negative emotions, it forces the brain to pay attention either way. So it doesn't need to be scary to remember. Scary is like it's a shock, so it makes your brain go, what's that? You know, so you, you pay attention. But when you're having a lot of fun and you're having a lot of humor and like playfulness, that's also a very, very strong form of emotion as well. So if you can use those in your images, right? So when I'm doing these images, I'll make them weird because the more weird and crazy and vivid and strange you make it, the better the picture, the more likely you are to remember that information, okay? So if I was in the, the straight jacket or something, I'd make myself fall over or trip over or something just to make myself laugh. <laughs> that's so. a little bit like making content that's controversial, isn't it? When it's vanilla, people totally. just carry on scrolling through it. But There's no when it's controversial, it get, it, it, people then engage, they react, they respond and stuff like that. Exactly. Okay, Inter oh, man, you got me thinking about so much stuff. <laughs> okay, now you said earlier you've helped people uh, remember their PL statements and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So a spreadsheet with numbers on. Mm -hmm. How would you go about teaching somebody how to remember a spreadsheet with numbers on? Sure. So numbers are difficult to remember because they are abstract. Okay. So if you think about shoes, shoes has a physical, tangible object attached to the word. You know what a shoe looks like. If you use something like love, it has no tangible association. It's just love is whatever is, it's in the eye of the beholder, right? So it could be a love heart, it could be Cupid with the bow and arrow, it could be some roses, it could be Valentine's Day, it could be a hug, it could be anything, right? But we have to create these pictures. 
right? So when it comes to abstract information like uh, numbers, you turn them into pictures. So if you want to do it really simply, the, the first easiest technique is to turn zero to nine into pictures. So zero looks like a donut, okay. right? Number one, you could use a picture of a pen, because it looks like a pen, mm -hmm. right? Or a baseball bat. Or you could make it sound like a gun, so you could use one as a gun, because it sounds the same, has three letters, right? So one could be a gun or a pen, right? So we're turning into a picture. Number two kind of looks like a, a swan okay. on the side, right? Or it sounds like shoes, so you could use shoes. Two, okay. shoe. Okay. Yep. Three, you could use a, a love heart, because on the side it's like a love heart. Okay. Right? Yeah? Yeah, I get it, yeah. Yeah, or you could use a tree, because it sounds like tree, three, tree. Right? Okay. So whatever, we're turning into a picture. Number five, we would say... Yeah, it four. Looks like, sorry, four. It could be a door, because it sounds like a door, four door. Yeah. Or a chair, because it kind of okay. looks like a chair, and a chair has four legs. Yeah. There's more associations, right? Number five could be a glove, because okay. it goes over five fingers. Yeah. Yeah. Or you could use the top of a unicycle, <laughs> if you wanted to, something like that. Okay. But let's use a glove. Number six, let's use sticks. We're just going to rhyme them now. Six of sticks. Okay, well, hold on. Give me the, give me the vision as well. Sticks. So six, I look at sticks. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And number seven could be an axe, because it looks like an axe, you know, for chopping wood. Okay. Yeah. Number eight could be an octopus. Eight okay. is oct, octopus. Ah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's an eight into an octopus. Number nine, you could use a cat, because they have... Nine lives. Exactly. So go through the list for me. So from zero to nine. So zero is donut. One is a pen. Uh, what was it? A picture. A swan. Um, three is a love heart. Four is a chair. Five is a glove. Yeah, it's a glove. Okay. Six is sounds like sticks. Seven is an axe. Eight is infinity, but eight is also mm -hmm. um, octopus. Nine. What was nine? Nine. 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 Don't remember nine. What was nine? It has a certain amount of lives. Cat. There we go. Zero is a donut. One is a pen. Two is a swan. Three is a love heart. Four is a chair. Five is a um, glove. Six is sticks. Seven is axe. Eight is octopus um, or, or, or infinity. Um, nine is a cat. Very good. Well done. So then. This is like the, the basic version of trying to remember some numbers. So say you have like the, the OTP or a, a pin code or something small that you want to remember. What we want to do is we want to create a little weird story with these images. Okay, so say that the, the pin code is 4672. So 4 is the chair. Okay. Yeah. Then the next one is an image of the sticks. So 4, so, 6, axe. So chair, uh, sticks, axe, swan. Very good. Okay, so then you go... Um, the, 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 the chair fell over the sticks that were mm -hmm. chopped by the axe. Yeah. Okay. The chair was like walking along and it like tripped over the sticks. The, right? Okay, so <laughs> the, the chair tripped over the sticks that then were cut by the axe, okay, which sat in the swan. Sure. Yeah, or being chopped by the swan. The swan's got an axe, it's like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so see what I mean by making it weird and absurd? Yeah. So the, the weirder you You're make it. You're a little it, bit more weird than me like that. I've done it a little bit longer, so. When I first started, it was like, yeah, the chair went over the sticks and then there was an axe and then there was a swan. You can use it for phone numbers and stuff as well if you'd like to. It's a really good way to start training your brain just to start using your visual imagery, your emotion, your imagination, creativity, uh, playfulness. Um, that's why kids are so fast at learning is because they use all those things just passively. They don't even know they're doing it. They're creating stories, right? They're like, oh, this like, is actually a horse. And it's like, I don't know, a stick. And you're like, no, it's not but it is to them. <laughs> so they're, they're being playful, they're using your imagination. What I teach is essentially to become children again, because using these elements is like the most important thing. When you get to about like child, uh, maybe like teenage years, the creativity gets beaten out of you. It's like, stop being so childish, stop being so playful. So what do you do? You stop being fun, you stop being playful, you stop having those thoughts, because it's wrong. So when you try to start to activate your imagination again, you're like, am I allowed to think this? Is this okay? It's like, yes, it's imagination. <laughs> it's not real. So a lot of it's teaching that. So that's with uh, the basic numbers, right? If you're trying to do something like a P&L statement, you want a little bit more of an advanced technique. And I use something called a major method, which is we turn the letters into, sorry, we turn the numbers into letters and the letters will create a word. Okay, so let's say that zero is an S or a Z or a S, phonetically the same in the mouth. One is a D or a T, because of one downstroke. Two is an N on the side, it's like an N. 
3 is an M, because it looks like an M on the side. 4 is an R, reverse it, it looks like an R. 5 is an L, top of 5 is an L. 6 is an, an SH or a SH or a J. 7 is a K or a K. 8 is a V or an F, and 9 is a B or a P, okay? So you don't need to remember those straight away, don't worry. But if I had two numbers, let's say it's a 2, 2, well, the, the letters are N, N. So I would remember N, N, and I will create a word with a vowel, so nun, like a nun with the the cross and the, yeah. Yeah, the black outfit, I'd imagine a nun, and I would put her on the painting, doing something weird, right? Then let's say the next one was 1-7, one that's a D and a G, dog. So I imagine a dog. So I imagine 2-2, two, 1-7, two, and then I would go to the next one. Maybe it's 3-6, that'd be mash, M, M, ash, so it's like mashing potato or something like that there. Next one might be, um, let's go with 8-2. Eight, eight, what would that be? File. So I'm filing the, the side of the thing. So now I've got 221736, one, uh, sorry, 82, and you keep going around, right? Um, so that's a more advanced method that takes a little bit more upfront time to get better at. But once you get it, it's instant. So I get people just to, to show them doing like 10 of these digits backwards and forwards in any order. If you ask me what four is, I'd be like one, two, three, four. No, oh, it's 82, right? So that's another technique, and then to be able to remember like PL statements and stuff like that, you'd take it a little bit further, but it's not necessary for this conversation. It takes a little bit longer. So <laughs> yeah. Wow. It makes me feel when I teach people stuff online or on Zoom and stuff, okay, that it's almost like my message isn't sinking in and I need one of those those things that you draw on, yeah. okay, to help people understand it. It's that, that, that association. When I heard about the, the kind of word association aspect to it before I was like yeah 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 but it's it's not word association it's just association it's association correct to as many things as you can think of easily exactly. that can relate to that subject matter or that word or that number okay got it so if you think about it as like say here's a little piece of information just floating around by itself here's a new word or a new name if you connect one thing it's like the spelling you've got one little strand a really thin hairline connecting to it right here but then you create a picture to it now you've got something else holding it stable. And then you create something else like a memory. So now you've got like three. So it's getting more and more stable as you start to create these associations. So you go, so, okay, so let's just take that word then, Anna, because we did that earlier. So mm -hmm. Anna, I say A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, and then I go, Princess Anne, is that what I would do? I'd pick, imagine Princess Anne? Yeah, totally. Okay, or somebody else I know called Anne? Somebody you know called Anna. Oh. And what does that person do? So Anna, maybe she's a singer. So imagine it with a microphone. Okay. All right, so we're creating another association. Spell the name backwards. Well, it's the same. So you're creating another association. Okay, so then <laughs> I can think about ABBA because ABBA's got, okay, exactly. okay, I get it. Okay, Maybe so I just keep thinking about things I can relate to it. So tonight I have to go to an event, mm -hmm. okay? And I'm gonna meet lots of people. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna be introduced to lots of people. It's my least favorite thing to do, mm -hmm. okay? Like I really don't like it. Mm -hmm. But I know I'm going to meet lots of people, and they're going to know me, and I won't know them. As soon as they meet me, they're going to know, they're going to know me beforehand. Yeah. So when I meet those people, I'm going to ha have essentially lots of names given to me very quickly. Yeah. So I meet you, Josh, one person in that moment, great. If I've got that for the next half an hour, I've only got to worry about you and your name, that's great. What happens if you're meeting people over and over again in a short period of time? And how do you then do that work of association mm -hmm. and then keep it there? You would find a distinguishable feature on their face, their body, what they're wearing, and associate it to that. So this is Mr. Blue Shirt, Spencer Blue Shirt. The Blue Shirt Spencer, cool. So you're making it backwards and forwards. Um, maybe, you know, I could imagine your shirt as Marks and Spencer or something like that. You know, um, my friend back in Australia, he was called Spencer. Uh, still is, I assume. Oh, sorry, <laughs> okay, okay, so you're thinking so Marks and Spencer. So he's wearing a, a blue shirt as well, okay. or your shirt, or maybe, you're a police officer because he's, he's a police officer as well. So I'm training these associations quickly to associate to you and your character. Or your glasses, maybe I can imagine spending your glasses or something like that as payment. You know, so I'm spending, Spencer, spender, spend, Spencer, right? So you can come back to it. So you're just trying to find as many little distinguishable features. Maybe they've got nose or ears or eyebrows that are different, right? Or a five head instead of a forehead or something like that. <laughs> maybe they've got a strange beard or maybe they've got different colors in the beard. Finding distinguishable features to be able to connect this information to, right? And that's going to help you a lot. Okay. Yeah. I'm so going to try that tonight. Yeah. See how I get on. I'll come back and let you know. And make sure to use it. Man, this is, um, 
this has been an excellent lesson and some <laughs> schooling, which I really appreciate you taking the time to come and talk to us about. I think we could sit and talk about this subject for another couple of hours because totally. I've just got so many more questions. But <laughs> what I want to do before we finish is just ask some, my, my audience have got some questions for you. I'd just like to ask their sure, questions. Please, and hopefully away. you can answer them. Would that be okay? Hopefully. Let's go. Okay, good stuff. What does competing memories mean? Mm -hmm. Okay, so can you explain what a competing memory actually is, just in succinctly so people can understand, okay, and how it competes in your head almost? Yeah. So retroactive interference is generally the thing, so it's competing. So as I mentioned before, if you're trying to figure out your 17th lunch, then your brain is looking for lunches. So it doesn't matter where the lunch is, it's just trying to find lunch now. Okay, so that's the key word. It's like a Google search engine. Yeah. Find lunch. It's like it finds all the searches, right? So then you don't know which one it is because you need more references to find it. So then you would look for the location, the stories that was happening, the people you're with. But at that time, all those lunches are just, now it's lunch and all these lunches are trying to get to the surface, right? So they're all like, it's me, pick me, pick me, pick me. <laughs> so that's essentially what competing is, right? So all of the, the lunches are trying to find their way to the top. But you're trying to find the 17th one, which you would have to find the, the uh, related information for. Someone said about a video with you, um, memory saving techniques with your, your grandmother. Yeah. Okay, they said they watched that video. Okay, so I got, I got that through. So they, they said, I love the video of you testing some memory saving techniques on your nan. Okay, can you improve your memory at any age? Is, it, is, there, is, there, is there an age limit? No, no age limit. Just like going to the gym, if you go, you get better. If you don't, you get worse. Okay. So if you start using your brain, essentially it's like a mental gym. If okay. you don't use it, you lose it. So okay. to go with that raw processing of data and information, peaks around 18 years old. Your short term peaks at around 30, 35, something like that. So that's, sorry, 25. Your so short term peak, peaks at 30? About 25, sorry, and dips at around 35, only a little bit. But then your long, uh, so your ability to, to process emotional states and all this stuff is much later, like your 50s and 60s. So your brain's always developing as you get older. It just depends on if you use it or not. Okay. Yeah. And by the way, in terms of short-term information, you said this in the beginning, you have a really bad short-term. Short-term memory is only 15 to 30 seconds for everybody. That's short-term. Short-term is 15 to 30 seconds? Yeah. Not, not yesterday or last week? Or... No, that's not short-term. Short-term is 15 to 30 seconds. It's your brain saying, do I need this information? Yes or no. It's making quick decisions to delete or to save. So then if it makes it anywhere past that into about a minute, that is long-term memory. Long-term is from one minute to the rest of your life. But then it depends on how important that information is for the rest of your life. Do you think that poor memories are a, are a societal problem? There's a, big, there's, there's, there's a big issue around There's a big it. issue, yeah. Because it's like having a small bucket and a fire hydrant trying to pour the information so fast that the bucket can't keep up. There's so much information happening all the time that we have to find a way to, to get rid of the information. Our brains was, was not designed for this era. It wasn't designed for this day and age. It was designed for water hole over there, lion's den over there, don't get killed by lions, water's there, let's get some food, let's survive. <laughs> That's what the brain was designed for. It wasn't designed to work out the mathematics of a black hole. Okay? It was designed to hunt woolly mammoths or hang out with woolly mammoths if you're vegan and find berries. That's what it was designed for. So now the issue is, so much information that we can't keep up. That's the problem. Do, a, do animals have good memories? Dolphins do. Uh, elephants have very good memories. So the matriarchal... Well, that's the, they, everyone, they say the elephant never forgets. Yeah. But like, most people have got a dog or a cat. Yeah. And when people don't see their dog for some time, you know, like they the go, dog there, they go away for a few months to come back, so the dog remembers them. Yeah. I don't know if the dog remembers, like I'm not an expert in <laughs> animal <laughs> memories, to be honest, but I don't think the dog remembers like situations as much as it just associates. So it's like the Pavlov's dogs, you know, when he brings the bell, they start to salivate, but it doesn't remember the specific meal. It's just like bell equals that. Yeah. So the dog will smell you or see you and like loner equals happiness or something like that. I don't think it's as situationally good as humans. We have metacognition so we can think about what we're thinking about which allows us to store these memories and allows us to, to recall all this stuff and to plan and to problem solve and all this sort of stuff. So we have a bit of a higher ability than most animals. How many followers do you have on social media? On TikTok, it's around 670,000. And on Instagram, it's around 30,000. Why do you think that is? I think because it's 
something that people don't know about very much is it's interesting, right? There's, there's countless personal trainers, so you really need to stand out. Memory training in itself stands out because it's, it's fascinating, it's new, and people didn't think that you can train it. People didn't realize how important it is until now. There's one guy that does it that's well known called Jim Quick. He's like yeah, the, and everyone point, knows, yeah. yeah. So he's kind of popularized it and he's had celebrity marketing. So he's brought it to the foreground where people actually think it's real now. And then they see another guy called Memory Coach on TikTok and I gave them a really quick and easy win. So they're like, wow, my brain's awesome. So then they followed, right? So I try to give as many quick wins and um, little techniques for people to be able to think, wow, my brain can actually do that. I didn't know that, that's cool. So it's a bit of an intrigue, mystery, as well as um, you know, a feeling of completion or achievement, I think, yeah. And back to what we were saying earlier, is like, I don't talk about me. <laughs> Everything's yeah. about how can I help t those people. What, what kind of questions do you get asked on TikTok then by people? What kind of stuff? Oh, a lot. Um, is, it, is it generally the same kind of stuff? Though? Similar, yeah. Give me an example of that. So how can I remember my course? How can I study for my courses? How can I um, you know, remember day-to-day -day stuff? How can I remember names, conversations? Um, I keep forgetting speeches and presentations. Um, you know, I keep forgetting where I put my keys or um, do I have a bad memory or I have a bad memory or I'm depressed. Does that mean I have a worse memory? Or some people try to say that they have aphantasia, which is inability to imagine, which is innate in human beings. We can all imagine. It's how we think about lunch tomorrow, or it's how we remember yesterday. It's imagination as well. Um, so it's generally similar sort of things, um, and all fixable. I've had a few people saying, you know, they've had big issues like strokes or um, aneurysms and all sorts of stuff, um, but that's very, very rare. It's very, very rare. The brain is so fascinating, isn't it? I it's mean, incredible. You think about what, what it can do, what it's able yeah. to achieve, and so many examples of what human, the human race has created. It's incredible, honestly. And it all starts with a thought, like that's imagination. We couldn't have a cup without imagination. <laughs> we couldn't think about what we're having for lunch tomorrow without imagination. We can't be having this conversation without imagination, essentially. That's what separates us. We're able to communicate in such advanced ways for at least our planet that the brain is just fascinating to me. The more I've learned about it, the more I'm like, I know nothing. Cool. <laughs> and I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. It just means there's more to learn, and it's great. Jeff, thank you so much for coming to join us on the show today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, man. I loved it. Thank you. So we have 60 to 70,000 thoughts a day, and most of them are from what we learned yesterday. How crazy is that? I learned so much when I was talking to Josh just then. Understanding how I can associate numbers with images. Trying to remember things that you'd normally forget are just a lot easier when you know how. I was so glad that he was able to share this information with us. Hopefully you took something from it too and it can help you improve your memory. Look, if you're enjoying this on YouTube, you can click here and get more episodes just like this one or subscribe over there, go on, subscribe. And you can get every single piece of content we make as and when we make it coming straight to you. I'll see you on the next episode. If you're listening to this on iTunes, then leave us a five-star rating, please, or in any other podcast app. Do us a favor, give us some feedback, give us a follow. Let us know what you like about the show, what you don't like about it, how we can improve it. Guests that we haven't had that you might think would be good. I want to make this content as valuable for you as possible, so your feedback is vital. Right, we'll see you on the next episode.